All right, my came to 33 students. Uh, like I noted in the email I sent out, uh, I will be doing today's lecture virtual. Uh, that's why you are watching this. So I will go through about 10 to 14 slides from chapter 10 and 11 uh, on alcohol. Right? So this is where we had stopped last time. We're looking at substitution reactions and we're looking at the effect of the living group. And what we had said is usually all these hydroxide, amide, ethoxy groups, and fluoride anion, those are all very bad living group. Whereas we employ these whenever, as living group, whenever we carry out SN2 reaction, meaning that, for example, we can just disregard this create a new one here, meaning that if I run this reaction, this does not happen, right? This is acting as a nucleophile, and this is my electrophilic carbon, and then this hydroxide. Remember, this hydroxide here, the living group here, right? Because we're trying to get to this product. But since we saw in this slide that OH minus is not a good, good living group or is a very, very bad living group, that's why this reaction does not happen. This is how you're supposed to interpret these. And these are some good living groups that you employ whenever you have to carry out SN2 reaction mechanisms. All right, chloride anion, bromide anion, iodine anion, and then tosylate anion. All right, so let's continue. Uh, so now I have written here as to what do not undergo essential reaction, right? So if you get this, chlorides, alcohols, ethers and amines. If you look at this, where do you think these all came from? From right here, right? Fluoride, when it leaves, it becomes fluoride anion. Ether, when they leave, it becomes leaves as OR minus. Amine, when they leave, as NH2 minus. And the alcohol, when they leave, they leave as OH minus. And that's why never ever do SN2 reaction with these functional groups, all right? Now this is, but then whenever chemists want to employ, for example, start a reaction with alcohol, right? For example, they are trying to, let's say, use this alcohol right here, and they're trying to, let's say, change to an alcohol halide. Earlier I said, okay, but we cannot run this reaction, right? We cannot get to these products that we want to get, but then how do you think? chemists do or run this reaction in the lab, right? So first thing, like we realized, OH is not a good living group, all right? So what they have to do first is they have to make OH a good living group by either carrying out one of these reactions. And you have to be comfortable with these reactions here, all right? So basically, when OH reacts with pinyl chloride, SOCl2 is called pinyl chloride, T-H-I-O-N-Y-L chloride. and Ether as the solvent, you get and this where the H is removed, and think about this O bonded to SOCNL right here. Same thing over here. So whenever OH bonds to this phosphorus, it forms as OPPR2, and the bromine is being kicked out. All right, now this right here, these two are very, very good living group. Then we can use chloride anion here to attack this electrophilic carbon, and then this OTS is a very good living group, and that's how we can get our SN2 product, all right? If you're wondering where I, where did I get Cl- as my nucleophile, remember this Cl chlorine is was being kicked out whenever this first set of reaction happened. So this chloride minus came back and attacked this carbon, 
to get the alkyl chloride. Same thing over here. Whenever this oxygen bonded with PBr3, this PBr3, only PBr2 is bonded to oxygen, meaning that you have bromine minus floating around, and that bromine minus can do the SN2 reaction to get your alkyl bromide. And that's how chemists make OH a good living group. And you will need this reaction. Okay? You don't need the reaction because you know, as to how you form the fluorosulfite or dibromophosphite. You just need to know that, oh, these two reagents react with alcohol to make a very good living group. Then this chloride anion can come in and attack this electrophilic carbon and kick this out doing an SN2 reaction. So this part is the only one you need for your reaction mechanism. And you start, please start creating this reaction mechanism that I've asked you to be comfortable with. Uh, so far, I've read about six to seven exams, and then the ABRIS has only come to about 60% for exam three, because most of the students uh, did not do well in the reaction mechanisms, error pushing reaction mechanisms. All right. Continue with the third factor that affects the rate of the substitution reaction, SN2. We're going to look at how nucleophile affects the rate. So basically, if you think about this, <clears throat> if the nucleophile has lone pair on it or negative charge on it, these are considered good nucleophiles, meaning that the rate of the reaction will be faster. All right? And then if the nucleophile is a better Lewis base, the faster the reaction. Now, if you're wondering what Lewis base is, in K-116 and K-115, we define Lewis base as species which are electron pair donor meaning that you have water this water electron drawn pairs can act as electron pair donor that's why this is a lewis space all right you have ammonia or some kind of amine All these are considered Lewis pairs, but they have electron pairs that can be donated to an assay. All right. So these are all good nucleophiles based on these slides. All right. And the other good nucleophile that you have already come came across is the acetylide anion. And why is it a good nucleophile? Because if you look at this, the definition of good nucleophile is it's supposed to be either anionic or neutral Lewis space, right? This right here is anionic, meaning that there's negative charge on it. That's why this is a very good nucleophile. That's why this reaction undergoes SN2 reaction. So think about this as this is a good nucleophile. This nucleophile attacks this electrophilic carbon and then this bromine leaving. And that's how you get your acetylide alkylation through the SN2 reaction mechanism. And here's the list of some of good nucleophiles. All right, now if you have noticed, most of these nucleophiles right here, they have either lone pair on heteroatoms or negative charge. For example, SS minus has a negative charge, right? That's why this is a good nucleophile. CN minus cyanide anion has a negative charge. That's why good nucleophile and so on. And if you look at this radio bread, this kind of tells you that, oh, if you have anionic species, Oh, it looks like the SN2 rate is pretty high. Right? The rate of reaction is pretty fast. Right? So these are some uh, good nucleophiles that I want you to be comfortable with. I just know them, right? So if I ask you what are some good nucleophiles that can be employed in chemistry, you have to start listing these out, right? For example, oh, S2O can act as good nucleophile. NS3 can act as good nucleophile. All right. So these are some of the neutral ones. So even within ammonia and this, right, even if you have some kind of RNS2 or amine functional group, 
since there is a lone pair on nitrogen, that's why this is a good nucleophile as well as well as all the anionic species. For example, the hydroxide anion is a very good living group. And then H2 is a very good living group, right? And then the fluoride anion is a very good, I mean, not living group, a nucleophile. Iron minus is a good nucleophile. Cn minus cyanide is a very good nucleophile. And then H minus. All right, so make sure you know some of these. So these are neutral Lewis spaces, which are good nucleophile. And these are all anionic species. That are considered good nucleophile. All right. All right. Moving on to slide number 26, <clears throat> the next factor that affects the rate of the reaction is something called the solvent, right? As to how the solvent affects the rate of the SNG reaction. Now, here's the relative reactivity whenever you do a methanol versus water versus some of these solvents, all right? Now here, right here, this is an SNG reaction, right? So you think about this, this N3 minus negative charge is attacking this electrophilic carbon and the bromine is being kicked out. So in one step, that's why it's an SNG reaction. So this reaction, whenever it was experimented under various solvents, this is what they found. All right, so now we're going to figure out what is the difference between these solvents. All right, so now let me make a list of the solvents that I asked you to memorize, and we're going to add three extra solvents for today. All right, so let's create a new slide. So I asked you to memorize water. Now remember, water is not an organic solvent, but it's a solvent that we do use in organic chemistry lab. I asked you to memorize methanol. I have to memorize ethanol. I asked you, you to memorize acetone. I asked you to memorize DMSO. So this right here is called DMSO. All right. I asked you to memorize acetic acid or vinegar. I think that's about it. I think I might be forgetting something. Oh, ether as well. I asked to memorize ether. All right. Diethyl ether. Right. I might be forgetting something, but I think at least for right now, let's see these. All right. And I'm going to add two more based on this list. The two, one, three, one, sorry, three more react. Yeah. Solvents. The three what that I want you to remember are these DMF, THF, and H2 nitro. And the structure of these. You don't need to know the structure of HMPA, but then I do want you to be comfortable with the structure of these three DMF, dimethyl formamide, or what is the full form of this tetrahydrofuran, and then H2 nitro. All right. So now, I'm going to put those under here, right? So when we grab DMF, it looks like this. Dimethylformaamide is an aldehyde that looks like this, right? If it's hard for you to think about this, so you have dimethyl. That's why you see this metal group over here, metal group over here. And formaamide refers to the aldehyde group here. You just have to memorize the whole. Oh, there is nitrogen in there as well. All right, the next one I want to memorize is TETA, tetrahydrofuran. Looks like this. So think about cyclopentane, but instead of one carbon, replace that with oxygen, and that will give you the TETA or tetrahydrofuran. And the last one, H2 nitrile, looks like this. It's a nitrile group. This functional group is called nitrile. C, the full content, 
right? When R group is connected to C triple bond N, we call this a nitrile. So these are the solvents. You have to memorize the structures and name of the HMPA. You don't need to know the structure or the full form. Just know that HMPA will be under this list. Why did I categorize all this this way? So let me show you why. So sorry. And the other one that uh, we talked about is CH2Cl, di dichromethylene. Yes, you do need to make those stuff to CH2Cl too as well. All right, so I've categorized these into three categories. To start to see that up, see. All right. So now, this right here on my top left, these are considered my non-polar solvent. So please note that down. The ether and dipyrimethane are generally, compared to other solvent that you've seen here, they are considered non-polar solvent, all right? And the other non-polar solvent that, oh, I actually memorize is hexane, benzene, oh, now I recall it, now I'm recalling them, right? Hexane, six carbons, benzene, and then toluene as well. So make sure you note that down, all right? Those are all non-polar solvents, Whereas these two ones, this and these, these are all polar solvents. That means if I ask you, draw the shots of two polar solvents or two non-polar solvents, I expect you to know that. All right. Now, even within polar solvents, we're going to distinguish these. These right here on my left, these are called polar protic solvent. Protic solvent, sorry, not a polar protic solvents. Whereas these right here, over here, these are all polar because these are all polar solvents, but then a protic solvents. All right. Now, what is the difference? Now, what you see is in polar protic solvent, there is hydrogen bonding possible, meaning that the heteroatom, for example, oxygen is directly bonded to hydrogen. If you draw the Lewis structure out, that's what you're gonna see, right? Same thing over here. The hydrogen is directly bonded to a heteroatom oxygen here. That's why polar protic. Same thing over here. The hydrogen is directly bonded to a heteroatom oxygen. Right, even ammonia is a liquid that is polar protic, right? Because the hydrogen is directly bonded to a hydroatom nitrogen. So if you recall from Chem 16, whenever we talked about hydrogen bonding, the hydroatoms such as nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. If you have hydrogen directly bonded to those hydroatoms, all right, as a solvent, those would be considered polar protic. Whereas if you have heteroatoms, but then the oxygen is not directly connected to the oxygen, those are going to be called polar aprotic. For example, we do have hydrogens here, right? But the hydrogens are not bonded to oxygen here in acetone. Same thing over here. In DMSO, the hydrogens here on these methyl groups are not bonded to oxygen directly. That means these are not capable of hydrogen bonding. Same thing with all these other structures. And that's why these are called polar aprotic solvents. Now, if you look at these, our reactivity looks like whenever you have polar, a, sorry, protic solvent, right? Methanol and H2O, but it is pretty slow. But then once we employ polar aprotic solvents, so that's DMSO, DMFC, S3C, and HMPA, DMSO, DMF, HMPA, CS3C, and look at the rate. This rate of reaction is increasing drastically. So what is this telling you is the ascent to reaction rate is heavily influenced by the solvent. And then polar aprotic solvent carry out the ascent to reaction much more faster than the polar aprotic solvent. All right, so that's the fourth factor that affects the rate of the ascent to reaction. All right, so now the next thing that we're going to start talking about is something called 
as sufficient reaction when you start SN2, we're going to start focusing on the SN1 reaction. In our SN1 reaction, the S stands for substitution, the N stands for nucleophilic, and then one stands for the reaction is of first order or follows the first order reaction rate, meaning that the rate of the reaction only depends upon the concentration of the alcohol halide that is employed. It does not depend upon the concentration of nuclear power. What it means is if you have an alcohol halide, here I have drawn a three degree alcohol, all right? And if you react that with a nuclear power, and you get your substitution product where this OH has substituted this Br to get your alcohol, all right? The rate of the reaction only depends on the concentration of the alcohol halide, which is written as Rx. The R representing the R group, uh, alcohol group, X representing the bromine here. It does not depend upon the concentration of water, which is a nuclear part here, right? That's what the one stands for. All right, now let's look at the reaction mechanism for this reaction as to how this would work. All right, so this is the reaction that we're looking at where this three degree alcohol bromide is reacting with water to give us alcohol and the hydrobromic acid. If you look at this, this is a tert butyl bromide, like chicken feet, if I draw it out. So I'm going to show you how the reaction mechanism is drawn here. All right. First thing, in the SN1 reaction mechanism, remember we said SN2 is a concerted CO and CRTED, meaning that your nucleophile attacks the electrophile and then the leaving group leaves in one step, right? Whereas in SN1, that does not happen. We have the reaction mechanism in three steps. So for example, in the first step, what's going to happen is your leaving group is going to leave right here, right? The bromine is going to leave, and what you're going to form is this carbocation here. And then the bromide anion that has left, right? That means you should be comfortable with this arrow pushing. This bromine is going to take both these shared electrons with itself. That's why the negative charge in the bromine, all right? And this is the carbocation you form. Now that carbocation is an electrophile because it has a positive charge. Then your nucleophile is going to go ahead and attract the electrophile in the next step. All right. Now whenever this oxygen bonds with this carbon, you're gonna see this happen, but the oxygen will have a positive charge. And again, like I said, in our final product, we do not want the positive charge. We want a neutral species, and that's why, in the end the basic electrons on the oxygen is going to pick up this hydrogen. The shared electrons bond is going to be dumped on this oxygen and that's how we get your final neutral product and then H3O plus. All right. I hope this makes sense. Again, remember, SN1 reaction happens in three steps. All right. That being said, do keep in mind, right? We said that the rate of the reaction only depends upon the concentration of the alcohol halide. Like, does not depend upon the concentration of the nuclear power. That's why our rate de determining step is going to be the formation of the carbocation. How fast this leaving group leaves determines how fast this whole reaction happens. All right. Now we drew the Energy diagram for SN2, we can do the same thing for SN1 reaction as well. Now, our energy diagram looks like this. Energy on the y-axis, the reaction progress or the post of the reaction on the x-axis. Since we have an intermediate in the carbocation, that's why we have two humps here. Now, that means your hump is going to look like this. All right, so it, assuming if it's an exothermic reaction, All right, this is the intermediate, and that is where your carbocation structure 
this. This is your reactant right here. This is your intermediate in the middle, and this is your product assuming this is an exothermic reaction. And the structure of this is your carbocation, right? So all I do is I'm gonna draw my carbocation, which was my intermediate, depending assuming that was the reaction I ran. Let's see, methyl group here, methyl group here, and methyl group here, and the carbocation. And that is the energy of your intermediate. Now, these two are your transition states. And remember, the transition state, the way we draw it is we're going to show our bond breaking and bond making with dotted lines. That means the transition. First transition state. Here, what has happened is this bromine is leaving, right? So that means if I try to draw the transition state, it's going to look something like this, right? So I'm going to draw the same structure here. B, C, S, B, C, S, B, C, S, B. But I'm going to draw a dotted line between carbon and bromine. Within my first step, we're trying to show that bromine lives as a living. And that's why this is my, what my transition state is going to look like. I'm going to challenge you to try to come up with the transition strict structure on the second half based on this. Because in the second step, right, this is what's happening, right? This structure is being formed, right? So draw this transition state out here. On top of this one. All right. And that's what the energy diagram for SN1 reaction looks like. Right here. Right. This is your, these are your reactants. This right here is your intermediate. This right here is the transition state. Transition state of the first step. This right here is the transition state of the second step. All right. And since this right here was our red determining step, right? So if you look at this, we said this right here, this first step, the formation of the carbocation was the red determining step. That's why this pump, the activation energy is the highest here. All right. All right. Now we're going to look at the same four or five factors that affect the rate of. SM1 reaction as well. Our first factor was the effect of alcohol group structure, and it's just the opposite. So if you recall from SM2, our effect of alcohol structure, and this is what we had looked at. We had said that, oh, as our hysteric membranes around the carbon gets bigger and bigger, the slower the SM2 reaction is, meaning that the zero degree alcohol halide is way faster than one degree alcohol halide, it's way faster than two degree alcohol halide and so on, right? Which we saw here for our SMP reaction, right? Look at this methyl halide. It's happening almost two million times faster than tertiary because this has all this hysteric hindrance where the nuclear part cannot come and form a bond with this electro part, all right? Whereas here, the hydrogen being smaller, the nuclear part can come and attack this carbon from the opposite face easily as the living group lives. So this was true for SN2. Now, not surprisingly, SN1, it's just going to be opposite. Look at this, meaning that our tertiary alcoholite is going to be way faster than secondary. Secondary is going to be way faster than primary, whereas primary alcoholite is going to be way faster than the Methyl alcohol halide. All right. Now, as to why that's the case, because if you look at this, right, when the because our first step told us, since this was the red determining step, red determining step, right, we are forming a carbocation, meaning that the more stable carbocation it forms, all right, the faster the reaction will be. So, if you look at these, Look at this tertiary. Tertiary is going to form a tertiary carbocation here. When the bromine leaves, secondary is going to form a secondary carbocation. When the bromine leaves, the primary alcohol halide is going to form a primary alcohol halide. Primary carbocation when the bromine leaves. And that's why, since tertiary 
carbon dioxide is more comfortable than secondary, and that is why you will see the rate of the reaction increasing as you go from left to right. Because of this reason, the stability reason. All right. Now, if you see, we have included the benzylic as well as allylic here as well. Now, if you think about this, why are these occurring way faster than primary and metal, right? It looks like, looks like allylic, halide, and benzylic halide, they are occurring at the same rate as the secondary halide, right? Now, the reason behind this is in the next slide. We're telling you the reason the allylic and benzylic carbocation ions occur at the same rate as our secondary alcohol like is because whenever the living group leaves and you form these two carbocation, what you're gonna see is, and I want you to be comfortable with this aerophysium as well, all right? Something called resonance can happen. So this is something that I taught you in chapter one or two. Basically, whenever you form a carbocation on the allylic position, these five electrons can move and form a resonance structure. Remember, structures, they are stable whenever they can form more resonance structures. And that's why you want to use benzylic carbon, I guess. This phylicum can move over here. When that happens, this carbon will have four bonds around it. Now, since this carbon right here is going to miss a bond, that's why the positive charge is going to decide on this part. I can keep doing this, right? I have this other set of five electrons. This five electrons is going to move and form a five on here. And that's why the positive charge is going to recite this. Because of all these resonance structures, benzyl carbocation is stable, similar with allyl carbocation. And that is why you see that the benzylic and the allyl carbocation, you have the same rate of the reaction as secondary carbon all right? So I hope this is making sense, <clears throat> all right? All right, now, something you have to keep in mind, right? <clears throat> so if you look at, think about our SN2 reaction, what we had said was, if you run an SN2 reaction, so let's say I run an SN2 reaction on this flowing. Alcohol, right? And we said that we said that whenever a nuclear part undergoes or attacks the electrophile and undergoes the essential reaction mechanism, we said there is an inverse of stereochemistry, meaning that oh, the oxygen has to attack from the opposite face. And again, please go back to the part one slide, all right, where it has a very good pictures that should you exactly what this bacteria like looks like. Right? You have a nuclear file, it's going to attack this electrophile right here, right? Then you're going to form this trigonal planar thing right in the middle, or if you include both of these, nuclear file and the living group, you're forming something called trigonal bipyramid layers. Transient scale, right? That's where the nuclear file is attacking from the back face, and that's why there is the inverse of stereochemistry. And that's why I am drawing my OH coming from the dashed face. That means whatever stereochemistry this chiral center had it is going to be here if the reaction undergoes SN2. But if you have SN1 reaction, this is what's going to happen. All right, so if we go back and look at this, let's go back to our SN2, SN1 reaction. Right? So let's say this is my chiral part. All right, so you see what you think about this. Let me just try that for you. For example, let's say if I have carbon here with three different functional groups.
All right, so this, this is my alcohol light, and I see that this is a two degree alcohol light, right? And then I read that with water. And let me just use wet mask for right now as a nuclear power. All right, now get leaving the some of the reaction mechanism. What happens is first I'll yeah. leaving the place, right? And I'm gonna form this carbocation. With fluid minus working around with my reaction plus. All right. So this is going to be my intermediate, this carbocation. Now, in the next step, I have OH minus floating around. This is my nuclear part. This nuclear part is going to go ahead and form a bond here. Right. But now, remember, if you recall from, uh, I don't know, triple weeks back, what I had said to you all is a carbocation species right here, right? But this is my carbocation species. And what you should have realized is what I had done earlier was an alcoholite which had a chiral center. All right. And I said that, oh, your carbocation, the carbon, is a planar structure because it's a flat structure and you have this empty p orbital, right? So it's a flat structure, the incoming nuclear power can come from the top piece, sorry, from the bottom piece, or it can come from the top piece. And that's what they're going to show you here, right? For example, this is your Alcoholite, think about this alcoholite as this alcoholite, which has a chiral center. Something over here, you have chiral center because you have one, two, three, four different groups attached to it. Then you're living with lips. All right. All right. Now, what you form is this planar carbocation. That means your nuclear part can come from this space or from this space. So that is why in SN1 reaction, we get both the R and the S. And do not worry about the 60% and 40%. We're just going to assume that we're going to get racemic mixture, meaning that this nuclear file has 50% chance of attacking from the front face and 50% chance of attacking from the back face as well. That is why in SN2, you only see the inversion of the stereochemistry in your product, whereas in your SN1 reaction, we're going to get both the S product and the R product. Because the nuclear part can come from the top face as well as from the bottom face. You will see here. And so the electrophilic carbon right here, carbon dioxide, right here, and the structure on the geometry is a flat shape. And that's why we can get both the R product as well as S product. All right, so take your time again. Remember, all these reaction mechanisms, like I said, it's not going to come to you if you just look at it once and just work on it once. No, it's not. And that's what I'm going to tell you for like ages now. And that's why most students that did pretty bad in the reaction mechanism in aeroplacing did really bad in this uh, example. Right? You've got to run through this reaction mechanism. For example, this reaction mechanism at this at the same time, depending upon how well you can uh, retrieve or keep your these materials in your long term memory. If you think that you're just going to do it two times and you're done, good luck. That's all I'm going to tell you. You've got to put in effort. Otherwise, the US and mechanisms will not come to you after two or three practices. Take out the scratch of paper, do it one time. After one, two hours, after one day, do it on the time. If we do not draw all these US mechanisms out at least five to ten times, it will not stay in your long term memory for a long time. All right. And you will need this as much as you Right, I hope this makes sense as to how you get both the R and the S product whenever you do the S and one reaction mechanism. And for this, try it out, right? Whenever you look after you watch this video, just take this reaction, right? Try to draw the aeroposition reaction maybe, similar to what has been shown here. Living with lips. Look at this reaction. Um, it can live in the plate. You want to form a carbocation. After you form the carbocation, you have a nuclear filling. 
oxygen, electrons on this oxygen. When you start to electron attach the star. But realize that when that happens, this oxygen is going to be pushed to charge because it's going to have three bonds and one bond here. Then it goes back to chapter one or two when we learn how to tell you the formal charge. And then we learn one charge species as our final product. That's where water is going to come in and attack the hydrogen. And that's how you get your nuclear species. Now, similar to what we had talked about in SN2 reaction and how some of these factors affect SN2 reactions, we're going to do the same thing for SN1 reaction as well. All right. Now, if you look at uh, the claim here for a living group, it's the same claim. If you go back to our SN2 reaction, our living will train with something like this. Right? We had OH minus, and we said they are bad living group, and the FCLBR I minus good living group, and OTS good living group as you go from left to right. In SN1, it's the same thing. That means if you recall one, you are able to recall the other one as well. Look at that. Right, as you go from left to right, same thing. It's a good living group. All right. Now, if you're wondering why is water a good living group, I want you to understand this. And this other way that scientists make OH a good living group. So please know this reaction again. For example, if you ever wondered, how alkene was made in one of the other chapters, right? So this reaction is going to be important, so it said this for the reaction. For example, we have this, and I'm going to include Br minus as my nuclear file. This, this we call alcohol. In the earlier slide, we said that, oh, if I want you to be with Br minus, we said the guessing doesn't happen, right? That means the way we are going to do that is two things, right? Because either you the SOCO2 or PBR3 and make this OH of a good living group. So now this OH is going to Think about this as I would bond with the sulfur, and this fluid, one of these fluids is getting left out. All right. So this might complete the story. Let's not include the bromine anyway. So now, this is a very good thing. All right. Same thing with PBR2, right? The OH itself is a very bad living group. That's why we have to make I mean, this a good living group by bonding the oxygen to and the R2. And then we said that oh, the fluid is going to come and use the nuclear, the nuclear part, and then it gets attacked and this electric the carbon. And then this with leaves, and that's how you get the alcoholite from alcohol. All right? So, again, what I did was show you this slide. Well, we started with it. And this is how we can make OX a good living group and have one of the halides attack this electrical carbon. This electrical carbon. That's what I'm going to show you. Yeah. All right. Now, the other way we can make alcohol a good living group is by putting it out as water. And that's where I saw the water here. Because it's like water, if you can make OX water, it's a very good living group. Right? Now, to do that, do it this. So let's see if I have this alcohol. And if I just turn some acid, what's what happens? If I just turn some acid, for example, if I'm running this reaction in the lab, what's what happens? 
this, right? This code is first I'm going to attack this high version. I think this is for now. I think about this as acid base reaction. All right. Now, remember, we said that the OH itself was not a good living group. But this right here, if it leaves, what's what it leaves as? It leaves as water. I think, let's, if you think about this as SN1 reaction mechanism, right? Living group leaving, it's leaving as water. And any time, you can get something live out as a neutral species like water, and that's the best maybe. And then maybe the chloride and I can go ahead and write it this. And then we will right? And that's why you have the water here, matter. Very good living. But then the way it's attained is by the alpha. All right, so I'm going to stop here, so I am at slide number 50, sorry, 35 in the bottom slide. And let me go to two more, sorry. And really quick, because I'm going to talk about the effect of nuclear power as well, right? Since uh, this is not going to take me, right? So remember, I, the nuclear power effect, we did say that, yes, the nuclear power effect has the two reaction, but if you think about the greater two reaction for SN1, for example, in my way that we are super SN1, it's going to be like this. I have a lot of things. I'm going to do a file. We have to use the R from the beginning of the file plus X minus. But then in this one, we have SN1. We said that the rate of the reaction only depends on the concentration of the output. Does not depend on the positive. And that is why for the effect of the nuclear power, it does not affect the reaction rate. So meaning the concentration of the nuclear power does not change the reaction rate of the SN1 reaction. All right? Look at that, that's the reaction I just talked about earlier. Alcohol, right here, we said alcohol is not a good living group, but then you can make this alcohol very good living group by whatever aerosin I showed to you earlier. So we will need this reaction mechanism. So I'll probably change the part one slides, but right now we'll need the reaction mechanism. Very fine. Right, last slide I'm going to talk about before. Elimination reaction is the picture of the reaction with the solvent. But the solvent is just the opposite. All right? Meaning that polar photic salt has to be put back to our home. This is the list of our solvents right here. All right? Now for SM1, polar Protic solvent is much more favorable than polar aquatic solvent. So think about this polar aquatic solvent, and this will go to SN2 reaction. Whereas, if we want to favor SN1 reaction, we use polar aquatic solvent. Even within polar aquatic solvent, the more polar a solvent is the faster the SN1 reaction is. And so, if you look at this, what is much more polar than ethanol, and that's why, even though both of these are polar protic solvent, water being much more polar, right? The reaction rate is polar protic solvent, which is the most. Let me stop here. I will be to meet after the um, Thanksgiving break, and we'll start going. Right. So make sure you start working on assignment. Uh, it's due in class.
after your break, and again, start working on the lesson you can do. Whatever lesson you can do, it's going to be comfortable with. You're starting comfortable. Otherwise, your fun exam is going to put your back really. And happy to meet you all.